Thank you for, uh, for inviting me. I'm afraid I may disappoint you. I don't have much, a lot to say about uh, media. I'm going to concentrate on cottage, and there's plenty of coffee in the back if you find it too boring. Um, the relation with media is that it's about a boycott that was uh, organized on Facebook. Um, it has been um, understood that social media can help political mobilization. Some people consider it that it may help also consumer mobilization to, to, to sort of to fight for some economic um, outcomes, not only for political outcomes. Uh, for example, lower prices. One such example, so this is not that crazy. You may remember, I think it was 2000 and, yeah, 2011, the debit uh, card fees by Bank of America and some other um, American banks, they were announced. Um, a whole rebellion was organized online until they had to, to drop it, so they never materialized. So, it, so, so social media was a, a, a tool for consumers to apply um, a countervailing power. In that case, it, nothing happened, so there's nothing to study. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the boycott where uh, firms already took some actions that angered customers, and we're going to see how that bargaining uh, went on. Uh, this is going to be, so boycotts uh, are classified between proxy and non-proxy. Uh, proxy is when you harm a firm to try to convince a government to change some action. Um, and there are plenty of those. Um, the, so what we're going to be looking is a non-proxy. So consumers are targeting a firm to try to, to curve their behavior in, um, in an economic dimension. This is going to be just prices. We want to bargain for lower prices. So that's basically where we are going. To my surprise, boycotts are, you know, every day there's mighty, you know, 50 boycotts going on. I never paid too much attention to them. Uh, uh, and, you know, they seem to be interesting and not used a lot for economic reasons, but I'll show you one and how it evolved. How did it start? Cottage cheese, to my surprise, is a staple food in Israel. Uh, so it's something that angered the population when they found that prices after deregulation increased by 43% between 2006 and 2011. Let me show you a picture. Up to 2006, that um, cottage cheese is the blue line. It's kind of flat, kept by some accounting numbers at that level. And the moment the government frees that price, you see it goes up by 43%. Uh, some of the inputs went up, then down again much less so it cannot be fully explained by input prices. So something was going on. So I'm going to go back later to that uh, picture. The, the main trigger of the animosity, of the anger of, uh, of customers was when there was newspaper coverage that many Israeli produced items were sold a lot cheaper in the US. And so for us, it's just price discrimination. For the general population, it was a reason for an outrage. That outreach led to a Facebook event created by uh, mostly you know, young students, young people, students, that threatened that if the price doesn't go down from you know, seven, so here you have the exchange rate, for a quarter kilo of this you know, product, down to five, which is roughly, I guess it was guided by the regulated price, that's roughly where the regulated item was, uh, they would start a boycott. The uh, threat was, or at least the, I'm going to show you numbers in a second, it was so popular that they said, well, we start immediately. So they got a lot of uh, attention from people that rallied behind the cause. And again, the trigger was uh, coverage that uh, you know, created animosity, that they were being charged a lot more than uh, people in the, across the ocean. So we're going to look at the evolution of prices, quantities, how people reacted. We're going to estimate demand before, after, and try to correlate it. That's all I have to say about media, with social media. Try to correlate whether the quantity declines and the price elasticity are related to some proxy of media utilization. Now, what's the role of social media? We think it's important here because there is no organized backing. This is not an environmental cause that there is some institution uh, trying to save um, you know, penguins. So these are just consumers that they were outraged. So unless there was a medium to organize and to send a credible message to, to make them angry and to show that uh, many of them are signing, because obviously you have a free riding problem, uh, it wouldn't have happened. So that's why you know, the, the 
Facebook in, in social media was important. So you can estimate demand, build an index of, of, the, um, of the impact of, um, of the boycott that's going to tell us by how much demand went down at the peak of the boycott, how long it lasted, and so on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to more ask a question, you know, does this have an impact on firm strategy? I'm going to argue it does. I'm not sure what the, the impact it is, but maybe you're going to tell me what it is. There is a literature, so let me not spend time, but most of it is on proxy boycott. Some of it is on finance. Try to see if boycotts have an impact on stock prices once the target is being under attack. Um, very few papers that are non-proxy, namely that are directly directed at the, the company to curb their behavior on their own. The product, uh, we're gonna we're gonna look just at the simple. Uh, most of the sales are the plain item, five percent quarter kilogram. These are the market shares. Uh, you see, there's one dominant firm that, by any measure, you would say, well, this is a, you know, almost a monopolist. By food conglomerates. The, not only sell dairy, they sell everything you know, from chocolates, beverages, and so on. Um, I already showed you uh, prices. And there's something, uh, as an IO economist, I'm a little bit puzzled why this is sort of slowly keeps going up. My interpretation, I'm going to show you the individual prices of firms. My interpretation is that they were trying to see how much they can get away with. And they found that they could get away with more and more and more. I'm going to show you also. There was a McKinsey report saying, yeah, you can get away with more, until they found out that they couldn't. But it's not they couldn't because the elasticity was high. It's not that from the revenue perspective it was a bad idea. It was because it would generate at some point an animosity, this Facebook event, and the whole thing blew up. But from the IO perspective, I find it pretty puzzling, right? So in a, any model that I'm aware of, you, you just deregulate. You know what your demand is. You know your cost. You just reoptimize to your new price level. Well, it was nothing like that. So I'm, 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 I'm puzzling. Yeah. So you said the prices were regulated until the red line, but there's still yes. a bit of variation of that. So, so it was it just a maximum price? Or what? No, no, I'm sorry. The, this is small uh, print. Only blue is cottage is an index. The others are input, just to show you that they don't. But, but even the blue line is, is not, you know, kind of fixed. At the oh, before, yeah, 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 because this is, this is a, a torture. Uh, process that the firms sit down with the regulator and, and, and the uh, you know, agriculturists and they all bargain and scream at each other and they come up with a price. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and we did sit down with one of these people that were involved in the regulation and they cannot even tell you how they do it. This is a, it's who screams louder and, and some kind of accounting measures. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't understand your question. So these are the events. Uh, outreach by media coverage of um, you know, large, you know, huge prices in Israel relative to the world, Europe, U.S., they pay more for exactly the same item, not competing items. And here you have the um, people signing up. On June 14, they, they opened the event by 16 with 30,000 and 70,000 and 100. Now, we're talking about a small country, right? And uh, not only small, but a bunch of them, they wouldn't sign up for, for different reasons, either because they are, you know, ultra-religious religious, and they don't, right, obviously are not on the Internet. And, uh, so 100,000 people is a lot for, uh, for Israel, especially for the secular kind of center part of the country. The, the threat will start early uh, July, but when they saw the success, they said, we start now. And what they did was uh, immediate threat. If you don't lower the price to five, we stop buying. And there was an immediate reaction by the main sellers. I'm going to show you the price distribution in a second. But the main sellers reacted immediately. Now, why was that? We just have a conjecture. And the conjecture is the product category attracted attention. So it was a good idea to look like the good guy, to say, oh, you know, we, we lower our price, you know, show up. And that would be kind of a lot. I'm not saying they were losing money, but it would be sort of to free ride on all the publicity and attract the customer. And now the customer is going to do the whole shopping. That's a story. I have no way to, to, to verify it. The only thing I do, and I will show you later, is that the manufacturers say, no way. We are not compromising on price. So it appears that it was the retailers. And one reason why the retailers would do it is, again, as a kind of loss leader to, to be the good guy in that uh, story. So retailers, uh, manufacturers say no. At some point, uh, the government 
under all this pressure, appoints a comi uh, committee. Ahead of this committee, just a side note, is an IO economist, Manuel Trachtenberg. I don't know if you know him, but he was, uh, you know, he was ahead of that uh, committee that discussed everything, not only uh, dairy products, but you know, cost of uh, living in general, housing, uh, nurseries, uh, schools for kids so parents can work, and so on. So that's the impact of uh, the IO community on, uh, on the Israeli uh, democracy. Now he's in parliament. So apparently it was somehow of a success, or he got made a good name. Um, July 10th protest is at the same time that uh, was, you know, in Madrid, the, um, I forgot the name what it is, but they, they go crazy there too. Indignados. Indignados, yes, yes, thank you. And, um, and, New, and the Wall Street, um, Occupy Wall Street. Yes, <laughs> Occupy Wall Street, exactly. So that's the same summer. So you could, see, you could say that the cottage was, right, the, the, the spark for the whole <laughs> movie. <laughs> um, so, so students, so after the, uh, the manufacturers say we're not going to compromise, students get crazy, and the different student unions say, well, now we're going to um, boycott all your products, not just cottage cheese. Um, the antitrust authority raids, so here is the McKinsey report, raids the offices of this uh, main seller, the, um, the monopolist, and finds the McKinsey report that says elasticity is low, keep going. 15% more. <laughs> and we are going to estimate the elasticities, and they were low. They could have kept going with higher prices. But one of the, the conclusions that I take as an IO economist is, well, yeah, we're missing something with those elasticities. We're missing stuff that is not modeled, that absent this animosity, you can have kept going to increase, uh, to, to maximize profits. But there's something missing in that demand structure, these long-run considerations that go beyond price. Um, so I don't know how to model it, but we're missing it. Mackenzie was missing it, and the firms missed it. So data, data, I'm not gonna spend time. This is just scanner data. Uh, we're gonna aggregate, this is pretty homogenous, and prices have an over 99% uh, correlation. So even if I wanted to separate, I cannot separate it. So we're gonna have sort of this aggregate. These are the store formats that go from the very small, where we have small, low coverage in the sample, to the larger ones. Uh, these are kind of increasing in sort of in the size of the store and, and kind of the discount, uh, where we have virtually full coverage. So there, there we have everybody uh, in the country. Uh, so here's what happens. So the, uh, the threat is the line, and what it leads is at that point, and I'm going to go back to is this collusion or no. I have no idea, but let's read the chart, and maybe we can... Um, have evidence in favor or against your statement. Um, so there is an immediate compromise on price. The, th the demand was go down to five. So they didn't go to down to five. So the, the boycott didn't stop. The boycott kept going and going and going for the whole summer. I'll show you that it lost some steam along the way. But it was pretty painful here. I'm going to show you how painful and what was the, the cost exactly on the firms. Um, is this collusion? I have no idea. So, so just from looking at the prices, you see that they do the part for a while. Here we have this uh, green, I don't even know which firm, it's one of the small ones, um, goes to try to be a price leader for a while. And they're selling a lot more because by then the cross price elasticities were high. I don't know if that was profitable or no, but in terms of market share, that was a huge increase in market share. At some point they give up. I have no idea. So what is suspicious, and we don't have the full picture here, is how this, go up, this goes up from, from sort of they're trying and trying and trying. So does this look as colluding? I don't know. Um, on the day, so remember, the, the, the event is created here, and within a day or two, it becomes a major success. Initially, they say, this is uh, mid-June. They're saying, we're going to start the boycott here, July 1st. When they see that they're succeeding, they say, we start now. We're going to stop buying. And that's the moment the, um, the prices go down. I can tell you what our story is. We think it's retailers because the manufacturer wouldn't be so stupid to say, we are not going to compromise on price, but compromise on price. So they announced we are not compromising the manufacturer. But in the main retailer, I'm going to show which retailers lower the price. They do it immediately, this 24%. Yes. And they do all three brands together. That's why we have more the suspicion that this is a retailer-based decision, right? Because they drop all three. 
what are the margins of retailers in Israel? 24% seems like <laughs> so are you selling at a loss? We, we have an idea of the margin because of the regulated prices. So, right, so here my guess is that they were not losing money. And this goes up 45, 43% with some increase in the price of milk. These are, these are the three different brands. And let me show you by, by, by retailer format. Okay. The, the small retailers uh -huh. didn't figure out something was going on and kept the price unchanged. Now I told them what's going on. It's, it's a, the harder discounts that act immediately, this, this, the, the largest retailers, they overdo it, right? So they go even below what's demanded. Maybe they were packing two for one or three for two. And, um, and at some point they go up, they rebound a little bit. So it's the large ones, and that's why it's consistent with, again, with the loss of your story, but I have no, no proof. And again, it's consistent with not being driven by the manufacturer because some don't even realize what's going on. Right, it's, it's, it's the larger formats that are saying. So immediate compromise by the price distribution. This is not by format, but you see it's those that are cheaper that do the compromise. The, the expensive ones, and this is consistent across the three brands. The top doesn't change, the expensive, the, you know, the 7-Elevens keep the price. It's the, the main, uh, the large supermarkets that compromise immediately and some even overdo it. Now in terms of variances, you see that also they hit at different times. At, at some point, they wake up, and these people start changing prices. It's the large stores that have these sort of the large variances immediately. They say, well, let's do it. And within a day or two, that you know, converges back to zero. So we think this is suggestive of being action at the retailer level and not the, uh, the manufacturer. So what's the harm that the boycott can uh, create? One is uh, if people indeed, beyond you know, claiming, I'm not going to buy, they don't buy. I'm going to show you that, that they stop buying in some areas related to utilization of, of media. Also, the attention generated the, the risk that the government is going to go back to regulate, to say, well, we trusted you and look what you did. Again, at the government level, they could open for imports. And they, um, believe it or not, in Israel there is a well definition of a monopolist, and those are subject to uh, class action suits that you can you know, go against them. And Tnuva is defined as, as a monopoly. Let's, so we start, we, we focus mainly on the loss in revenue because that's what we can quantify. And the rest we can say, well, the risk is out there. We're going to treat this as a leftover. So let me start saying what I, we can say. And, and then you're going to complain about what we cannot say. So, so this is by format. Same format I showed you before. Those that did not compromise on price, you see the, the, the serious decline. Right? So, right, so these guys didn't realize that they should compromise on price, and they lost this guy saw almost 40% of our sales and so on. In contrast, the large sellers that compromise on price immediately, they, you see almost no decline, right? Because they, they counter it by lowering price and sort of now we have to distinguish the, the, the move over the demand curve versus the move along the demand curve and that's what we're going to do next. So what I'm going to build is a but for boycott calculation. We're going to estimate demand before, plug the new prices and say, well, what would have demand been Absent the boycott, we're going to take the ratio. That ratio is going to be our index of um, boycott intensity. So let me show you what we do. It's basically the following. Before, the, there is some demand, beautiful, you know, green, yellow, whatever that is, at, at zero. That generates some sales. After the boycott, we see that quantity declined a little bit, but only a little bit. But prices declined a lot. So we go from this cloud into this cloud. What we're going to do is estimate demand plug the new price and say, well, this is the gap between expected according to the old demand and observed after the boycott. That ratio is going to tell us this is how much we're going to attribute the decline uh, due to the boycott. We're going to do that estimating this uh, log log uh, demand function. Very simple. We only have either three or six products if we include. We included watches as a similar product that might be interacting. We found that the, the um, substitution was very, very small and the numbers virtually don't change, especially, especially before the boycott. So we're going to end up with three products. The three brands, prices on all, sorry, quantities on all prices, going to give us some um, <laughs> predicted quantity after we plug the post boycott prices. Take that ratio. This is what we observe, divided what we would expect. Say this one is 10% uh, smaller, it means that they boycott lower demand by 
10%. Uh, so let me show you. Yes? You, you don't want to allow for some different cross-store versus cross-brand substitution? Uh, oh, we would love, we, we, are, we started to work on cross-store. Um, the simple statistics um, here, we, we don't get anything. I'm not sure. No, here we don't have. We tried. We thought that would be interesting. Whether well, once you raise awareness, people start to shop more. We didn't get anything. We now are switching to a more uh, pricey item, say coffee, where people might start switching. Um, one that would be helpful in kind of pinning down what you said before, which is you think it's really the retailers who are, who are moving. Yes. Yes. Right, so one thing that people tell me, some locals tell me, is that this is an item kind of bought more than once a week, one in the big uh, supermarket and then in the, your corner. So maybe we are not gonna pick that, but you know, yes, we want it, we couldn't, we failed. This is the index. This is the beginning of the boycott, and what this is saying is the initial drop in demand. And this is aggregate for the whole country, which is, I think is very impressive, because take areas where people are not even aware, some areas they don't care, some they don't consume, this is going down by 30%. Now at some point, either because of the initial price compromise or because they're so hungry for cottage, you cannot live without cottages, you know, some people are saying, you know what, let others boycott and this whole thing disappears. Right, so how can you live without cottages? Let me show you, uh, th this is um, prices of white cheese. And what I'm showing here is that prior to the, the uh, the, the boycott, prices were very similar between cottage cheese and white cheese. As the boycott starts, the prices of white cheese actually in the stores that were the most likely to compromise price for cottage cheese, they increase the white cheese. My interpretation is that said, look, you have to eat something, right? So you're gonna boycott me on, on cottage cheese. I'm gonna you know, <laughs> get your money on white cheese. And that thing backfired very soon. So they increased the price. So that's what the graph shows. They, they, they increased the price of the white cheese at the time of the event when they were compromising on cottage. And at some point, you remember, I told you is when the students get upset and they say, oh, you're not going in price. I'm going to record all your items. And that's when they say, well, you know what? We rather compromise to the same level that we are, we are compromising on the cottage. So our, again, we don't have a full picture. We only have white cheese as a substitute and it appears that the supermarkets were not, that, or whoever it is, were not afraid. They, they say, well, you know what, I'm gonna compromise and cut this, not even that, but I'm gonna increase my price on closed substitutes. And God's care at the moment. The uh, boycotter said, I'm gonna boycott everything. So I don't know what they would end up eating if they boycott everything, but <laughs> that was the, the statement. So the, the impact on demand, as I show you, the index shows at some point demand starts going back whatever it was. Did it have a lasting effect? Well, we were surprised. That it, I think, or at least the boycotters might be surprised if they ever read this paper, that the, the lasting effect wasn't on the level of demand, but was on the elasticity, which is also painful, right? So you think of increasing demand elasticities, now you're gonna end up in a national equilibrium with lower prices, right, if you believe our first order conditions. So what we do is now we estimate the same function, the demand function I showed you after the boycott. And I'm going to show you some numbers that we claim are interesting. There isn't a lot about firm A, although it's illegal for me to tell you A is true, A is the leader, it is, so you may end up in jail. Uh, so th there is a tiny increase, but it's not significant. For the uh, other two, the, the increase in own price of the city is quite large. So it does translate into a reduction in markups, I'll show you later, of between five and eight percent of markups, if we believe they were pricing as, um, now, beyond the own price elasticity, check the cross. <coughs> right? So the cross is where most action is, and maybe that's what we should have expected, that once you raise awareness that you're being ripped off, you're gonna search better, you're gonna say, you know what, maybe I don't need it. They're not that different, these products. I'm gonna uh, subsidize it. And you see on average, they go from non-significant to something reasonable, they increase like, you know, point, like five folds uh, all across the three brands. So, so we have the, um, the event. We do before taking probably three or four weeks. So this is clean of animosity. Then we have a, a, you know, a period of turbulence. We clean those three months. We, we, we leave the, the summer out for the indignados and all the rest. And then we do from, I think, October till the end of our sample. Hopefully, you know, both are you know, now settled.
and that's what goes up. And it's, a, it's consistent. I'm not, we have no proof, but it's consistent with uh, paying more attention, searching more for a better price. Social networks, can I say something about them? Not much, but uh, you know, it's a media conference, so I'll try. So what we have is census data where at the block level, we are going to have some demographics. We're going to have a cell phone utilization. We're going to have a Facebook. No, not we wish we had Facebook. We're going to have personal computer, um, education, and so on. And we're going to try to correlate two things. The uh, index, the boycott index, with these demographics. And that's what you have here. We're going to build this index at the store level and correlate it with all these demographics. And what this is saying is, in areas where there's more PC um, ownership, the, the index fell by more. In areas with internet, fell by more. With a BA education, at least, fell by more. More phone, uh, cell phones, fell by more. Uh, person, religious, a percent of people in religious school, uh, fell less. Okay, and there we, we have good reasons why religious were not on Facebook, I guess. But, so we tried age and, and didn't. There is another great story. I, again, these are my, my co-authors. I don't know what the story, but what they say is that these very religious areas, they have their own boycott mechanism, which is around their, their religious community, that if, if the supermarket really abuses them, it's the rabbi who's going to say, you know what, don't buy. So those prices are already low. So that's, anyway, so that's another type of social media. But I guess it's not contained in this uh, conference. Going back to the demand, so what I'm going to do is sort of before and after, buy this type of demographics and um, below and above some threshold, it's actually the median for PC utilization and for a bachelor's degree. And what you find here is, if you remember for brand A, there wasn't much going on, so there's not much going to be going on here. It is um, a little bit interesting that above median, those with more uh, PCs and those with more education were less elastic to start with, which in a way it makes sense. It might be proxying for, for income, and they were less um, price sensitive before. Once you do the comparison uh, before and after, what you're going to see is that for the brands that it matter, the above median is the one that changed the most. Okay, At least uh, here, you see that this is own demand elasticity of brand C. The above median before and after, the, the gap, the increment, was more than the increment of this guy. Uh, same here, consistent with the story that they were less um, price sensitive, but the boycott made those with access to, to media uh, change their behavior more. Consistent with the story. It doesn't work for brand A because we didn't have significant effect to start with. Um, one thing before you attack, I mean, I'm surprised you haven't attacked me, but since you didn't, I'm going to do it on my own. So I'm not claiming any ca causal effect. I'm not saying, well, if you gave Facebook to people in the, in the yeshiva, now they're going to start boycotting. So we're capturing with this proxy is kind of the total effect. So this is people in demographic areas more likely to be boycotting and at the same time more likely to use Facebook. Do we see that being correlated with the index and with the change in demand elasticity, right? We're not claiming that go give them Facebook and we're going to have a countervailing power. We are taking as given that Facebook was the format, the medium for the countervailing power. And we're trying to see, well, do we expect more of an impact in areas where people are more educated, higher income, and see? And that's what we are finding. It's kind of the total effect of having the access and having demographics that make you more prone. The coverage was there. Once it started, was it also then covered on TV? Yes. Yes, yeah, yes. This was on TV. Um, in, and I should say that it's not over. You, you still see on TV once in a while that somebody, or even in the newspapers, that uh, people you know, compare prices to, in, to uh, Germany, in Berlin, or in, in, in Poland. And it, it's kind of a, a, you know, a, a leap of attention comes and scrutiny on these firms which, again, I don't know, but I heard from my co-authors, that they started to be in panic. They started to hire image consultants to try to see how to prevent the next episode where this animosity comes against them. I guess, is there some back of the envelope calculation you could do just 
given the number of people who actually use Facebook, or who are actually part of the Facebook group, to say, imagine that the only people who do the boycott are people actually on Facebook, could this 30% effect that you see be driven entirely by those people? Or is it the case that there are too few people on Facebook for the Facebook group who have actually produced this entire effect, and it must be that most of the people were learning about it through television or some other word, word of mouth? Or right. So, so we can, yeah, we can, we can do that, um, that calculation. Of course, of course. So, so, yes. So, so let me just try to say you're one hundred percent right. My guess is that Facebook was kind of a catalyst, something that enabled people to to organize. But then a lot is going to come from right that once people organize, it's going to be covered in the newspaper, it's going to be covered in television, and then it's going to be some you know grandma that's going to say, oh, these kids are right, right, and she's not going to buy. Absolutely. Uh, by by no means I'm saying that, right. But but I think for the organization for for coalescing the, the um, right. So that's in terms of elasticity. Uh, this is what I told you before, where they are afraid of spillover. Early on, no. They just uh, spit on the face of, of the customer. And they sort of <laughs> spit upwards. And <laughs> they know this, it came down. Um, so what can we say about the prices? Well, what we're going to do is the, the standard I.O. So for the I.O. people, this is going to be clear. For the rest, it's going to be like crazy. But I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, so, so what we do is we, we assume some first order condition. Once you have that first order condition, you can impute marginal cost. Assuming the marginal cost did not change from one day to the day after the boycott, so that remained constant, we're going to impute the, the first order condition later. And what we have is a relation between um, the markup before and markup after dictated by uh, the two elasticities. And that's going to tell us uh, how much of the 20, what was it, 24% price decline, can we explain by the long-lasting impact on elasticities? And our claim is going to be, that's going to be part of the story. It's going to be five and eight, probably an unintended consequences of, uh, consequence of the, of the boycott. But one, it cannot explain anything about A, right? Because there was no change, no significant change there. And for the other two, it explains but only like a third of the whole, or even less, a fourth of the whole price decline. And the conduct assumption here is that the retailer just adds a cost to this cost, is that? The, our assumption is assume you have an integrated or two-part um, contracts in which you charge marginal cost and then a transfer. Uh, so we are only, oh, oh no, no, no. I don't no. see why those are all the same thing. You don't see? Oh, oh you, you have the two-part. Yeah. The optimal is going to be a marginal cost. And you have a single markup oh, instead of double, exactly instead of double market generalization. Now I'm 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 forgetting that again. One of my co-authors <laughs> computing two layers. So what he did is say you have two layers, and it's similar. So now we explain a little bit li large. It's in the last section of the paper, but still we are below half of the declining prices. So but that's a good point. We did assume the two layers. Now are we? Do we believe in this further? No, but that's what everybody does in I.O., so I'm going to blame Steve, <laughs> who, is my, who, who is my elder in I.O., so he, he has to, to, sub, you know, to defend it, so that's his problem. And, but, but, but indeed, if they're colluding, and they might be. I'm not saying they're not colluding. I'm saying I don't know what they're doing. This is all wrong. Uh, is it all wrong? No. It, it, in the sense, it's meaningless, in the sense that there are infinitely way, many ways to collude. I don't know how they're colluding. So using first order conditions would be arbitrary. So, so let me tell you a little bit about the, the, the what happened afterwards. In, uh, today, I mean, last time I, I was there, the price was still below, at least in, in my mother's uh, <laughs> supermarket, was still below seven. So it seems that three years, is it three? Is it more? Oh, it's four years later. They're still below um, what they used to be. And look at this lesson. Was it, isn't this beautiful? So it taught them about modesty and humility. <laughs> you know, what else can you, what else can you ask for? It's a, and so, so they, they are now emphasizing the opinion of the consumer and his needs. Part, and, and now they are self-regulating. <laughs> is is isn't this a phenomenal impact? But, but this is not 100% ridiculous in the sense that what the antitrust authorities said is, yeah, you're doing great. So, so these prices are under scrutiny. And the antitrust authorities said, yeah, white cheese is not good, 
But look at this, cottage cheese, because it did not find unreasonable profitability as in the past, it's not going to be re-regulated. So apparently the antitrust order is believing that these people are under self-regulation. Uh, and they're going to keep uh, monitoring. So there might be something there. I don't know. What is it? I don't know what it is, but it might be something. And so that's what we did. So boycott, prices down, no further concessions. Apparently there was a need for further concessions because it's sort of the, the boycott impetus fizzled. There was a long-lasting impact that I bet the boycotters did not uh, think about the first order of the conditions, I'm pretty sure. And, um, but, but prices went beyond what the first order of the conditions say. And as an ION economist, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, well, so I'm, I'm even more critical of BLP, this is <laughs> of using <laughs> first order of the conditions because they're missing, or they could be missing uh, something. Interesting about social media, we have nothing to say, but you know, here it is. Thank you. Very good. So I'm uh, ha happy to be here discussing this. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, noticed the announcement of the conference and uh, said, oh, I see you're talking about cottage cheese at an upcoming conference. And uh, I got to say, I, was, I, I hadn't even read the paper. And, and as an IO economist, I was perfectly willing to defend the study of cottage cheese because we study markets and many different markets can be you know, laboratories for learning about the way that markets work. But actually, this turns out not to be, I think, a, a paper uh, that's mostly about cottage cheese, obviously. And I, I actually think, if anything, I think maybe the authors maybe undersell uh, its, its, its applicability. So, uh, you know, Eagle did a good job. We understand the idea of the paper here. Uh, a couple, even last night over dinner, people have emphasized to me that this was a really big uh, political movement that really shook the country. This isn't some obscure thing, right? I think there were questions of, of you know, political uh, parties falling uh, or even being formed and so forth around this. And again, not just cottage cheese, but there's this general issue of the cost of living in Israel and how come goods that could potentially be imported or something cost so much more in Israel or how much how is housing so expensive and so forth. Uh, and so one of the things I want to emphasize is that this is, Israel's traditionally a fairly socialist country that was undergoing uh, deregulation. And so the threat of regulation here is, is extremely real and, in fact, active threat as we go on here. And I think that's something that makes this, um, this pretty interesting. They put it um, partly in the boycott literature. And so this is the literature on, you know, uh, during the Iraq war, did the boycott of French wine do anything? And the answer is no. And, and I think those papers, I find those papers not fascinating, really, um, that fascinating. I think this is more interesting because this is, I think, endogenizing uh, economic regulation in a political context. And actually, that's the way I would sell this paper. And I actually think it, the Eagle's always a little modest. Um, I actually think that's more uh, interesting a way than putting in the context of this boycott literature. Because what's really going on here is there's a, there's a massive political movement. It's true they're expressing it through, I won't buy your product. But we see in the paper that that's probably a secondary effect, actually. I think the primary effect here is we're very mad this is a democracy. You can end up under regulation again, and how do you feel about that, right? I think that's, and I think that's really interesting. This is about endogenous regulation, not about uh, a boycott of cottage cheese, although that's you know, part of the form that it took. <laughs> uh, and that's what I really find, that's what I really find uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, in this topic here. So there's a little literature on this, but there, there, um, there's not a lot. Uh, that it might be thought of contributing once we think of it this way. Probably the closest paper is this Sarah Ellison Catherine Wolfram paper on price restraint in pharmaceutical prices. So this was uh, some, so we old people remember that uh, there was a big politically charged debate over, the, over uh, universal health care after the election of Bill Clinton as president. And there was a serious and highly regulatory uh, um, uh, proposal on the table to regulate the healthcare industry with a lot of price regulation, much more, say, than in Obamacare at the time. And what they show is that uh, while that debate was going on, increases in pharmaceutical prices suddenly abated. So prices have been going up like this. There's a huge debate over price regulation. Prices go like this, right? <laughs> the other thing they show is that, you know, uh, I forget how they do this. They claim that they I can see which firms are more uh, uh, likely to be affected by the, by the regulation, and that's where you see the greater price moderation. I think there's some similar things in this paper that they've done and could continue to do. Uh, uh, Republicans take over Congress, the threat abates, and prices go back on their merry way, 
right? So that's a similar story, I think. But again, it's not so much about a boycott as it is about political threat, right? And I think just in this case, the political threat takes the point of public protests and boycotts and so forth. But the boycott is a, is a way of organizing, I think, to a large degree, as a way of organizing that, that, that political uh, outrage. And you know, th there are different outcomes here, right? I mean, the political threat can, can, can uh, have reduced prices and no re-regulation. Uh, I think you know, Nancy Rose would tell us that you know, 19th century railroads were monopoly, the, the farmers were upset. Uh, there was a huge political pressure for regulation, and then the regulatory structure that resulted was probably a kind of compromise regulation that actually, I think the classic story is that uh, the regulation sort of agreed to put the price in the middle, right? That the railroads would do pretty well, but maybe not quite, quite monopoly. So, you know, there are a number of different outcomes uh, uh, of these kind of political protests with the threat of regulation. Sometimes you might actually get regulation, sometimes the price response might be enough to, to, uh, to offset the regulation. It's kind of an interesting political question, I think, as to when when one happens and when, when something else happens. Okay, so you know, he's got that first grapher. So you say you want to write an effects paper. Did this have an effect, right? He's got this fantastic, just single difference, but it's so convincing, right? Prices go along like this, right? And they go, boom, 24%, and then they stay down there, right? So you could just sort of say, done, convinced, thank you very much. Uh, take a little bow and sit down, uh, because that just strikes me as super convincing. Something happened that was big, right? So the boycott had an effect, right? So there we go. Uh, the boycott had an effect. So they actually do go on, which, which is good, I think. And, and the question is, can we say anything about, about why, what the motives were? Right? And so partially in the, in the paper, this takes the form of a little bit of a narrative and the lost leader and so forth. And part of it is uh, really about uh, estimating a model. And I think the idea of estimating the model then is to break uh, things into two, two effects. There's a change in demand because of the boycott. In their results, this takes place uh, in the long run, mostly because of it due to a change in the, in the slope of on a cross price elasticity. In, in the short run, it's probably also a, a large uh, decrease in the, in the level of demand. And then, you know, whatever else is going on is kind of the residual, right? So you sort of control for the direct effect on demand. And then the residual part I would call the political threat, right? And that's a bunch of different, it could be strict price regulation, you know, uh, weakened import quotas, uh, whatever. But that, they're treating that, they're treating that residual as this kind of interesting thing here, right? Um, uh, so, okay, so um, uh, my estimate demand systems, I often estimate discrete choice demand systems. They make an argument that I gotta say I, I agree with. Um, uh, if you don't have very many products, you don't necessarily need a discrete choice demand system. So I think in the end, they're down to three products, really. Now, after I first wrote this, I, and then I was thinking about the instruments, maybe when I come back, you know, they have nine own and cross price elasticities in their basic specification. And the question is, is there really enough exogenous variation in the data to get nine own and cross price elasticities or not, right? And first I thought, yes. And then, I don't know, last night I wasn't sure. So we can, <laughs> I'll be modest and say I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, and there are limits to what you can do, right? But, you know, you could get a nested logit that really had two parameters instead of nine, right? Um, at first I thought, well, why? Nine's not so many. So maybe we, should th we can think about that uh, over the next couple of minutes. Um, okay, so the standard I.O. discuss and contract, you know, this is printed out. It's got the section that says, if there is demand estimation, you must talk about price endogeneity, right? So I'm actually contractually obligated, right, to talk about uh, the endogeneity of price. Okay, so, and it's a, you know, everybody understands this point, right? Um, um, uh, they control for some important stuff. They've got, they've got brand effects. They've got day of the week effects. And uh, somehow those are not controlling for everything. Sometimes people come up and they say, oh, but I control for everything. Well, if you control for everything, prices wouldn't still be moving, <laughs> right? So prices are moving, whoops. Uh, and given that prices are moving, they're moving conditional, uh, they're moving conditional on, on the things that we see. And the usual thing is, is it left out supply or demand factors? There are left out demand factors because you're not getting a perfect fit. So the question is, what are those demand factors? And mostly what I want to say is I just think the paper could discuss this a little more. I'm not actually sure you should do anything different in the end. Uh, but I think you maybe just take a stand as to what these factors are, right? There's some sort of, it's not like the paper ignores the issue. There's a nice discussion of endogeneity. There is a, uh, there is a, a, a treatment of it for sure. I just think it might be nice to take a stand on, you know, here's our sort of consistent story that's one story. It's not crazy for this industry, and it says this isn't so bad, right? Um, now, and of course, the problem is there just aren't great instruments here, particularly to get nine own and cross price elasticities. You know, the price of raw milk is going up. You might argue that even that's not exogenous as the dairy industry. But anyway, maybe better than prices being exogenous, but that's one instrument. In a discrete choice context, this is what I was thinking last night, is you could interact that with brands. Um, in, in, in this context, that actually doesn't help. The, the, the equations themselves are brand specific. 
uh, uh, I think I would be happy to use some of that run up to the new price, right, at, to get the pre boycott elasticities. You know, kind of like uh, um, um, regulatory dummies interacted with brands might be, might be one source of instrumentation. And by the way, my thought there is that you're right, we teach the graduate students that the minute after the deregulation, they know their entire demand system and they should pop, pop to it, right? You know, uh, hypocritically, what I tell the undergraduates is, you don't have to know the demand system. You just change your price a little bit, and either your profits go up or down, right? And if they went up, you think, oh, I'm climbing the profit hill, and you should go a little more, right? So I think you're, you're, you've got evidence for what I tell the undergraduates, not what I tell the graduates. <laughs> um, that they're sort of, you know, climbing up the hill and sort of, oh, it worked, worked. The profit's going up, 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 right? And, uh, you know, whether they were all the way at the, you know, so that would say maybe at the end they're all the way there, maybe they're not. Uh, in which case the first order conditions still don't hold because they haven't found the, uh, the top of the hill. Uh, they do make a little bit of use of these so-called Hogsman instruments, which are prices in other cities. They have the right number. They have nine of them. <laughs> that's good. But if they're correlated demand shocks, the class, that's the classic uh, critique of those. Um, you know, so they are going to estimate via OLS. We need to assume the demand error is independent over time or something like that and observed after the prices are chosen. So they set the price and the demand error pops out afterwards. You can't predict it. And you need to be some excluded supply shifters. Even if you're not using them uh, as instruments, they have to be moving price. So they have to be somewhere in the world, even if we're not seeing them. So that's what I'd kind of like you to maybe take a little, little stand on, right? Be a little brave and just take a stand on that. You know, if problems with the first point is, you know, if we're not really completely controlling for advertising or weather or trends or something, you know, those are things that would be in the demand error and, and would cause a problem for OLS. So as I said, I think they should just maybe take a uh, stronger stand. I think they're probably would go to, and consistent with what I think they say in the paper is, classic thing in supermarkets is there may be randomly timed sales that are pushing the prices up and down. And that's pretty nice for demand estimation, right? Uh, Eagle has written before, though, that probably leads OLS to actually overstate elasticities because there may be some coordinated advertising and people may be willing to sub. I don't think they're probably storing cottage cheese, right? But you may be willing to, you don't get your month's supply of cottage cheese, I don't think. But um, uh, you know, you may be able to eat a lot of cottage cheese one week when it's on sale, and the next week eat a lot of white cheese. And, you know, so there may be substitutions in, in you know, marginal utility over time that, that allow you to do this. So that would actually say maybe these are a little high. And of course, then the real question of interest for the paper, though, is how does it affect the difference between pre and post boycott, right? And I think the paper says, a little bit optimistically, but I'm kind of fine with this. Why should that be biased? Why should that be biased? Uh, if you were cynic, you'd say, why should it be right? <laughs> so <laughs> you can sort of take either, either attitude there. Uh, uh, OK, so I, I, what I really like is they, they give this first thing, and they could do the perfect collusion and some other things. But the change in these elasticities is real, which is interesting, and sort of is a kind of moral anti-advertising or something, you know, become more price sensitive, works a little bit. That's actually kind of interesting to know about consumer education, but not enough to explain a 24% price decrease. Uh, so let me come back to that last point in my last two minutes. Again, I just want to say about the demographic effects, I think that's very nice. It's nice to see these connected households participate more in the boycott. Given my view that this is really about political threat, I'm guessing that these are politically important households as well, and that you may not need 50% of the people or 100% of the people. You may just need some politically uh, uh, salient and critical households to get really, really upset, right? People who can talk directly to their representatives and so forth. I don't know if you can show that, but that, that would be my story of why, this, why these demographics uh, are important. On the other hand, of course, if you had something that only affected politically unimportant households as a mechanism for, for price control, this would not be a great one. OK, so I asked about this at breakfast. And, and you know, so this seems a really complicated way to deal with a problem of high markups, that you organize a national protest that uh, re re brings in the specter of price regulation, which seems like a kind of sucky way to deal with this anyway. I don't, you know, these screaming rooms full of people may not be setting prices optimally. Are there other things, this is not for the paper, but I just think it's a policy question that's raised. Are there other things that you could do, right, to deal with this problem of markups? Could you, how important would it be to liberate trade policy, a zoning policy to give you more stores, right? Uh, some kind of entry policy. How do you let the small dairy farms uh, grow and have access? Distribution policy. My guess is in Israel, as in, by the way, most American states, a bunch of these sectors are just really highly regulated and are interfering with competition. So is there sort of a possible deregulatory response instead of the sort of political threat of regulation, which most of us, I think, would find not the optimal uh, way to deal with the problem of high margins? But again, that's really, I just think, the politics that comes uh, that comes out of this. Okay, let me defend first order conditions for a minute. 
Well, okay, except not. I should be modest. You know, if your behavioral model is wrong, your first order condition is wrong, <laughs> and I think we've always known that. Uh, there are some papers that model a, sh model a shadow cost of policy. I've done that kind of work, a quota or something like that. And in some sense, I, probably you can't really get a threat of disaster for the firms, kind of like last, uh, the last paper yesterday, in and have a shadow cost of, of the threat of deregulation in the first order condition. But that's the spirit of the way that you would fix a first order condition, and that's what we've done in the past in the trade literature, to try to get the policy. You, you, you've got a shadow cost of a, of a behavior that's just not showing up in there. Uh, last point. Uh, this idea, are they coordinating, at least at this point? Again, if you think of the, of the Ellison Wolfram paper, are there some firms that should be internalizing more of this effect? Is it the large firm or the small firm? I, I don't know if you can do anything like that, but it seems like a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, an important point. It raises interesting questions about social media, the way you use it to, get, to affect regulatory outcomes. Uh, yesterday on the plane, um, uh, headline Airbnb and Uber use their platforms to mobilize users on policy. That's to hit deregulation rather than regulation, right? But again, it's another piece of evidence that social media, uh, the internet can be used to endogenize regulation in a political context. Okay. Convincing empirical results. Um, um, uh, I like this as, as adding to our very small body of evidence on the threat of regulation, which endogenizes regulation in the political context, and that we could start thinking about this as, you know, where does regulation come from? What's the role of the media and political organizing in that? I think that's pretty cool. And then on the policy side, just looking at Israel, I wonder if there aren't some other solutions, maybe for what seem to be, in some cases, really high markups, and what, you know, should we do about that? Thank you.